This audio file contains portions of a phone interview between Carol Baggerly, Director of Grassroots Health, and Dr. Reinhold Veith. They are discussing a paper which studied vitamin D and fall rates in the elderly. Surprisingly, the highest vitamin D group had the greatest falls. The mainstream press concluded that vitamin D did not help with falls. The study dosed using high vitamin D only once a month. Dr. Veith explains how this dosing should have led to negative health outcomes. Well, basically, um, it's already known that uh, you know seasonality affects uh, falls and fractures, etc. Um, in you know areas that don't have winter, uh, there are differences in rates of falls, etc. That um, go seasonal. Right. And there are quite a few publications, actually, um, I could send it to you, okay. where, um, you know, places like New Zealand or Australia or China, right. um, they have essentially the same phenomenon going on, but you've got artificial pulse doses of vitamin D created because of, you know, uh, seasonal differences in sunshine okay. or monsoon or weather, etc. Um, so, very similar to the uh, Sanders paper from a couple of years ago, that one happened to give uh, 500,000 units of vitamin oh, D once a year. Right. Um, but, I, you know, the open question is, when is a vitamin D dose sufficiently pulsatile to create a, kind of an artificial winter in terms of vitamin D? Um, and I think, you know, the paper that they did, the study that was funded by DSM, um, it was a really nice study. It had to be done. And unfortunately, the results uh, weren't super promising, but they're not actually super negative. Like, we're talking of a p-value on multiple testing of 0. 0.048, so that they're making a big kerfuffle about something that's barely statistically significant, um, but which uh, would be consistent with the pulse dose issue. In other words, uh, you can't, um, you know, essentially give vitamin D on relatively rare occasions in large doses and then uh, flush the toilet and say, well, okay, now I'm not going to give it for a while and it keeps falling. What do you think is changing when you give those large doses? Well, you know, the thing that makes vitamin D different, uh, both from other nutrients as well as from other hormones, is that the enzymes that are handling vitamin D are functioning below their KM. Um, it's almost like thinking about a factory, an enzyme is like a factory trying to produce something, a hormone, and that factory is functioning below capacity. In other words, if you throw enough raw material in the door of that factory, the factory will produce more. And if you throw a whole bunch of stuff, um, eventually, you know, the factory has to adapt to that. And the machinery that generates the hormone made from vitamin D, or which also um, breaks down vitamin D, is functioning at below capacity. That's the way the system is designed. So normally you might think of yourself as, you know, okay, I've got, I'm living in San Diego or in, um, you know, Alaska. And there are differences in terms of how much vitamin D you get. But a key thing that creates... Um, a message for the body is how is that vitamin D fluctuating? In other words, I'm trying to make it easy. You're doing fine. <laughs> um, yeah, I know, but I'm just trying to formulate uh, my way of explaining it. Sure. Um, vitamin D is an agent, a raw material with which your body makes a hormone. That agent is normally produced through sunshine exposure. It fluctuates uh, with season as you have more or less sunshine. Mm. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Perhaps it's part of the human body's mechanisms to recognize seasonal change, you know, whether it's the rainy season or the sunny season. You know, rainy season, you're going to go indoors and relax, etc. Go into winter, etc. Mm. Um, and so the knowledge, the fact that everybody's ignored to this point is that in places that do not have what we consider to be winter, there are still seasonal increases in muscle function and decreases in muscle function, falls, etc. that happen across the course of the year as, 
you know, you have more and more sun or cloud, etc. Mm -hmm. And these are realities. And by pulsing the dose of vitamin D, we're creating a false message to the body. In other words, you create a dose that's large and actually artificially rapid compared to what you would get through being in the sun. Right. You know, like if, if summer comes along, the vitamin D level is going up over the course of, you know, a couple of months. Right. Instead, what they're doing is once a month giving a pulse dose, which was logical in some ways because, well, we don't know what happens if you don't give it. Right. Or, you know, what, what we try to do when we're creating a clinical trial is make things as convenient as possible for the person. Right. And it's always more convenient to take low doses less and less frequently. Right. Um, I thought that one month was a logical dosing frequency, but the interesting thing is those dosing frequencies that are longer than a week are ones that seem to create questions in people. Hey, we didn't get the observation we expected, or we're getting more fractures. Why is, why is this? More vitamin D causing more fractures. It must be bad. Mm. On the other hand, pulse dose of vitamin D for a moment in time, raises the dose of vitamin D, which creates changes in the enzymes that handle vitamin D. We know that fluctuations in vitamin D, um, you know, tend to have negative consequences, that when vitamin D is heading downwards, it's almost like a paradoxical vitamin D deficiency. Even though, like, for example, you know, the, the, the first um, papers that came out about what you call these U-shaped relationships where it appeared that higher 25Ds were late, related to bad things was the, uh, the two OHEMA paper on prostate cancer around 2010. Sure. Um, and that one was essentially saying, hey, in the countries that have the highest rates of prostate cancer, the best 25D level is the average one for that country. To get you go, wait a minute, what the heck is going on here? Well, you ask yourself then, well, in Sweden, who's got the highest vitamin D level other than the person who eats a lot of fish? Well, it's the guy that puts on shorts and suntans, which Scandinavians and Northern Europeans tend to do. <clears throat> you know, younger ones are really suntanned. They love the sun when it's there, but what does that do during the more than six months of a vitamin D winter? In other words, the person that has the highest vitamin D level achieved during the summer has got the biggest drop right. in 25-hydroxy-D for the rest of the year, and it's that dynamic drop in 25-hydroxy-D is something that the body has to keep adapting to, because you raise the vitamin D level, the body says, oh, I got a lot of this stuff, I'm going to start washing it out faster. Mm -hmm. Then suddenly you take it away, as if you took away a pulse dose or you would take away summertime sunshine, mm -hmm. and what the body sees, what the cells see are paradoxical vitamin D deficiency. Like you can look up, you know, I've got a few articles on the, on the mechanisms of this. And to me, it's no surprise that bad things happen when you give pulse doses. I'll send you one paper um, from New Zealand, Falls and Fractures, Seasonality. Yeah. Yeah. And inside of that, you will see cited, you know, at least four or five other articles that talk about relatively sunny climes where there is seasonality in falls and fractures. Okay. In other words, you don't need winter right. um, to create greater falls and fractures that people don't necessarily fall on ice. But on the other hand, those falls and fractures happen um, during, you know, the, the, the rainy season, etc., or, you know, the cloudy season when, you know, people aren't in, you know, the sun as much. Right. Um, so that I'm certain, like, at least philosophically, you know, you ask yourself, okay, it's reasonable for entities, animals, humans, to somehow have a biological adaptation to seasonal sun exposure. You know, is it rainy season or sunny season? There must be some reasonable function that knowledge of that for the body would do. Now, mm -hmm. how is the body supposed to know whether it's rainy season or sunny season? And one of it is the vitamin D. Vitamin D by itself isn't a hormone, but it initiates a whole bunch of different kinds of signals throughout the body. Mm -hmm. And I'll bet you that what we're looking at is, you know, seasonality because of vitamin D changes. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, like, for example, oh, you know, if you have a physiology lab, like I used to do, like, 
So you'd put your hand in a bucket of water. Mm-hmm. If you hold your hand, you'd have two buckets of water, one warm and one cold. Mm-hmm. Essentially, you can tell the difference. After a while, they both feel the same, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Then you switch your hand around and put the hand that was in cold water in a warmer environment. Well, anyway, but you feel severe temperature differences. Right. Just your sensation of temperature, even your visual perception of how bright it is, is based on differences, not absolute amounts. So what I'm getting at is differences in vitamin D. You know, the change from 120 to 100 nanomoles per liter or the change from, you know, 60 to 50 nanomoles per liter are sending the same signal that something is changing. Just like when you put your hand into different temperatures, even though your hand may have acclimatized to it, you know, subtle differences in temperature are what we receive. It's not absolute things that we measure, it's relative things that we measure. And likewise, with vitamin D, relative changes in vitamin D are important, not simply the absolute amount of vitamin D. And I think people have oversimplified it. Right, I agree. In other words, they go, oh, yeah, yeah, you need more vitamin D. But more vitamin D does a constant thing. It does hopefully good for you. Right. My argument is, no, it's not that simple. Is the vitamin D changing? Is it rising or falling? Because that dynamic rise and fall is what's sending a signal to the body. Follow? I do. Um, Reinhold, yeah. on the the rising and falling or the enzymatic reaction, do we know anything about something more specific about that? Like it does something to the enzymes. What does it do? Yeah. I mean, can we follow that through okay. a little bit? Well, there's some evidence in the um, Bishop Ferrari study, for example. Um, if you look at the 25 hydroxy D level changes, right? Um, they went at baseline with uh, the lower dose from 14 to 50, uh, from 15 to 55. In other words, the low dose, right. the 2,400 units once per month, raised the 25 hydroxy D by four zero nanomoles per liter, 40. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. twenty four hundred raised the blood Actually, test result. Actually, it was twenty. It was twenty four thousand. Twenty four thousand. Sorry, mm-hmm. I misread. That's yeah. okay. If you look at table two of the paper, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Twenty four thousand once per month. Baseline was fourteen point nine. After twelve months, it was fifty five. Right. That's a difference of four zero. Right. Okay, take more than double that dose. Um, it raised it from. Um, 19 up to 80, mm-hmm. essentially um, six zero. So you're going, you more than double the dose, but you only got half as much more increase. Right. What I'm saying is the reason that the bang per dose, the bang per buck, um, gets down, goes down is because the enzymes are adapting to the higher dose of vitamin D. Okay. That's part of the evidence. So you, the, the reason that you don't get as much of an increase is the body has adapted to the higher dose. Now, take away that higher dose, and the body is trying to wash out amounts of vitamin D that shouldn't be washed out because you suddenly don't have any anymore because you've taken away that pulse dose once a month. Okay. Um, uh, so the enzymology I've sort of described in a couple of publications, like one being a... I think it was a 2009 paper I can forward to you. Please I do. also covered I also covered it in a chapter on vitamin D pharmacology that I published with David Feldman. Okay. Uh, 2011 or 13 or so. Um, anyway, you've got evidence that the breakdown of vitamin D differs from the different doses that you've got here. And, like, my contention is if they gave the dose on a daily or weekly basis instead of once per month, there would have been, you know, no harm and probably benefit. I would think, well, what I would have wanted to know was, okay, you've got levels measured once a month. I would want to know what was the level a day and a week after giving the dose. Right. Good. Day and a week. Good. Because that, that unknown tells you the peak. Right. Typically, when you measure something, it's measured as a trough value just before the next dose. Right. So that there's a little bit of an unknown in the knowledge that's presented in the paper. Right. We don't know what the maximum is, but probably 
you've got a cycling, monthly cycling of higher doses, lower amount, uh, higher 25 Ds and then low vitamin D, 25 Ds. Mm-hmm. So then the body would be adapting to that higher vitamin D level, higher 25 D level, but you're faking out the body, you're tricking it on a monthly basis, telling the body, oh, we've got a lot of vitamin D now, throw it away, you can throw out the extra, and then you take it away, and the body's still getting used to throwing away extra vitamin D, which effectively causes what I call a paradoxical vitamin D deficiency. Which is, what, lead, which is what leads to the more falls or fractures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but in the end, the gist of it is that with the higher doses given on a pulse basis, you keep faking out the body. You say, here's a whole bunch of vitamin D. Oh, okay, I'll adapt my mechanisms to get rid of it. And then you go, oh, oh, now I took it away. It was a pulse dose, fooled you. Okay. And the body's sort of washing out the extra vitamin D and says, oh, well, now I've got too little. Mm. And then the next month comes along and you keep pulsing it. Mm. You follow? I do. So, I do. yeah, pulsing it, it, it like, <laughs> one analogy is like if you're living in an older house and having a shower, you know, this is the kind of thing you think about while you're having a shower because <laughs> you have a hot water tank. Right. You know, like if you have an older house, you have a limited volume of hot water in your tank. Right. And while you're having your shower, um, you know, as the tank runs dry, you're forever adjusting the valves to control the temperature that's hitting you. Right. Okay. Analogy, well, vitamin D is like the hot water coming out of your tank. Right. And as it runs out, your body is forever adjusting the enzymes to keep, you know, the cells properly comfortable for the amount of vitamin D that's coming into the system. Right. Okay? Yes. You do pulse doses. It's as if somebody keeps either, you know, perhaps flushing the toilet on you, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then your water gets too hot, and then you're adjusting the valves, and then the toilet tank is full, and, you know, you keep going through cycles of discomfort. Right. The people who wrote the editorial are highly respected individuals. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, um, Keel was a co-author on the Journal of American Geriatric Society. Um, yes physician statement about 4,000 units per day for seniors. Right. So they're, you know, on our side and taken aback by something. And I know Bishop Ferrari was taken aback by it too because she had, about around 2013, she already, um, you know, confided in me, you know, we've got this study. I'm trying to figure it out. Why is it that we've got worse results for the people on the higher vitamin D dose group? She didn't give me any details, but she was trying to figure it out at that time. And, you know, was really compelled to present her results. I don't think she was in a position to make huge speculations on it. Right. You know, she's just presenting it as she sees it. Right. But, that, you know, like, my feeling is that uh, these are levels that are high physiological levels. I could not imagine that people living in the tropics with high levels of vitamin D would have suffered any consequence because that's the level for which our bodies are designed to live. Right. So there's no harm in it. The, thing, the harm comes from the seasonality. Or, you know, the, and pul- or the pulse dosing. Pardon me? Or what you have called the pulse dosing. Pulse dosing, yes. yes. Yeah, seasonality, to some degree, gives a clue as to what will happen if you pulse dose. Okay. Okay. So it's an artificial um, or paradoxical vitamin D deficiency mm-hmm. caused by tricking the enzymes handling vitamin D into thinking that there's an abundance mm-hmm. which you every month take away. Mm-hmm. In terms of the credibility of the people, you can't beat it. Oh, In terms yeah. of the credibility of the journal, you can't beat it. So like one, one has to you know, accept what is there. I feel that um, there's almost a... Uh, Oh, a standard response on physicians' parts to take a, a certain stance on it. In other words, yeah, 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 nobody needs any nutrients, and look, here's even a bad story about them. Right. You know, it's so easy to fall into that right. as a trap, especially when there's confirmatory evidence for that <laughs> glib statement, right. you know, when it comes to the Bishop Ferry paper. On the other hand, my feeling is that you have to take that knowledge in context and at least to me all it does is confirm what I thought I already knew exactly exactly 
Well, thank you, and I look forward to talking with you more on this because this is a big deal.